This episode is brought to you by Kia's first three-row all-electric SUV. The Kia EV9. With available all-wheel drive and seating for up to seven adults. With a zero to 60 speed that thrills you one minute. And available reclining lounge seats that unwind you the next. Visit kia.com slash ev9 to learn more. Ask your Kia dealer for availability. No system, no matter how advanced, can compensate for all driver error and or driving conditions. Always drive safely. Make their Christmas unforgettable with goat guns. Looking for the perfect gift for your husband or man who is a gun lover? Look no further. Goat Guns are the greatest gift of all time miniature gun models. They are the perfect blend of quality and detail. From pistols to rifles, there's a goat gun for every collector, history buff, or gamer. Whether for display or for a fun collecting hobby, Goat Guns will bring joy and excitement to him. Surprise your loved ones this Christmas with a goat gun, the ultimate gift that won't disappoint. Shop at GoatGuns.com. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Krissa Zindros Boyce about the power of personality and reputation. Chris uh, Zindros Boyce, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I'm so excited to have the chance to chat with you. You have such an interesting background. Uh, you bring a lot to the table in terms of uh, some some fun discussion. You know, as we as we talk about personality, we talk about interpersonal relationships in the workplace and how that connects with personality, but also how it connects with reputation and um, kind of how reputation feeds into influence and power. Uh, so I'm excited to have all of that kind of discussion with you today. As we get started, I want to share Chris's bio with the listeners. Chris Zindros Boyce brings over a decade of management and executive level leadership to the Handle Group. Uh, throughout her career, she has worked alongside C-level executives, building brands and creating numerous businesses, uh, driving initiatives, that have positively impacted sales, profits, and employee retention for large and small companies. Having served as a director and vice president for many notable brands, Krissa has been responsible for spearheading the launch of various divisions and managing national teams of 20 plus individuals. Her responsibilities have spanned marketing strategy, project management, talent development, creative direction, and consumer experience. In 2008, Krissa came to the Handle Group to further hone her leadership skills. After a few sessions with her coach, she realized that she had a longing to help people succeed in life and, and in business. Quickly thereafter, she decided to become trained in the Handle Method, which uh, I imagine you'll be able to tell us a little bit about today, Krissa. Krissa has been teaching individuals how to integrate the method into their lives. She leads workshops and corporate retreats and works privately with individuals and teams. Her firsthand understanding of organizational structures, the breadth of her leadership experience, and her innate creativity make her a dynamic and insightful coach. In her practice, she helps uh, many business leaders, entrepreneurs, and corporate executives to build their careers, enhance their results, improve communication, better manage their time, and transform personal and professional relationships. Uh, originally from Connecticut, Krissa now lives in Manhattan with her husband. She is an avid traveler and reader. She is currently working on her first book and the renovation of a townhouse on the Upper West Side. So uh, fun, such a great background. I also love traveling and am an avid reader. And really in terms of, of your experience, it looks like we have a lot of overlap in terms of our interests, in terms of the type of professional work that we do. I think this will be a fun discussion today. I'm looking forward to it. And I now want to flip the table and ask you the questions. 
<laughs> we'll save that for after the podcast. Yeah, well, sounds good. <laughs> hey, before we launch in, anything um, that you would like to share additionally by way of background, uh, personal introduction, or just context as we get started in the into the topic? You know, the thing that always comes up in these uh, podcast interviews, and it's interesting that it's been coming up so much more lately, and it probably has a lot to do with the social, economic things that are happening uh, in the coronavirus world and also with the social unrest in our country, is that my parents are immigrants, and uh, they really did, like, come to the U.S. from Greece and didn't know any of the language, had zero education, bootstrapped their way through having children and building businesses. And so I'm a product of that. And it's funny, you know, my dad still to this day is like, in my past life, as you were reading off my bio, I worked in retail. So I would oftentimes tell my dad, I dress mannequins, dad. That's what I do for a living. I dress mannequins. And he would always be surprised that people would pay me to dress mannequins. And now he's like, they pay you to talk to them? My dad's like, you know, surprised that somebody would pay me to talk to them and help them figure out career strategy and their life. So uh, that always comes up. So I share that only because I I have that perspective and it absolutely impacted me because I was somebody who didn't have the education, opportunities, the money, or even the parents who knew how to navigate any of those systems in my uh, growing up years. So I really had to figure things out on my own. Well, thank you for that background. And yeah, I mean, as uh, as a new immigrant family and trying to learn the ropes and, and navigate the systems and just to make it in, in a new environment, that's a challenge for anyone. Um, so uh, kudos to your family, to you for, for uh, persevering and, and for making those efforts. And you really have such a, an excellent background um, and such a, a great profile uh, for the work that you do. Um, one of the things I know you talk a lot about with, with your clients, with the people you coach, uh, is the power of your personality. Um, now, obviously, in the workplace, we, we don't work in isolation, although I suppose right now with people working remotely, maybe it seems more isolated, but we do work in teams and we have to interact with each other um, and we have personality differences, we have trait differences, and that all can influence you know, how we collaborate and work together in the workplace. Um, so I want to talk about that. But first, what do you mean by the power of your personality and how do we leverage that in the workplace? Yeah, it's a good question to start with. So um, the first thing I will say is that the way that we make people feel is a direct byproduct of our personality. So when we are interacting with people and whether we leave them with a positive or negative or neutral impression, that is going to impact how they walk away, thinking about the interaction, thinking about themselves and thinking about us. And what's true for anyone who's in an organization or just in any part of your life is that how you make people feel is your reputation. So if I have people walking away feeling from me like I'm a good listener, then my reputation is I'm a good listener. If people walk away from our interactions thinking I'm impatient or having the experience of me being busy or unavailable, then that's my reputation out there. And most of us, the biggest problem is that we don't live in the impact of our personality, we live in the intention. So what that means is, you know, I might be really busy today and, you know, just kind of be quick with you and I leave you with the impact of I'm impatient and don't care, but I'm sitting in the intention of I was just trying to move quickly and have this conversation and I have no idea that I just impacted you like that. And so when we're trying to get things done in an organization, when we're trying to self-promote, politic, uh, move to the next level, go on interviews, all these things, we oftentimes are blinded to how our reputation is actually impacting the results that we're trying to cause. So that's what I mean by the power of your personality. And then how to leverage it is to really be willing to go on the other side and as sometimes painful as it might be, hear the impact you have on other people. And I'll, I'll share some of the fun, not so flattering impacts I have on people in a moment. But that's what I mean about leveraging it. Yeah, well, and that's right. I think we, we we often judge others on their impacts and we judge ourselves on our intentions. And that's just not the way it works. Uh, in our interactions, interpersonal interactions with other people, 
um, the best of intentions. I, I do believe in good intentions. I think it's important to have good intentions, but uh, it's ultimately the outcomes that matter. And and we can't. We're not mind readers, and so people don't know our intentions, uh, but they can see our behaviors. They can see. They can observe what we say, what we do, and and so we need to be very mindful about how we're interfacing with others, how we're interacting and communicating and um, working with those around us, and just recognizing that, that everyone has their own unique background that influences the lenses through which they observe us, right? And so when you talk about impact, a lot of that means we have to know not just ourselves and how we interact with others. We have to understand others, their worldview, their lens, so that we can see how they may be interpreting what we're doing. You nailed it. Exactly. Yeah. And that, and that can be really hard to do. And that takes intentionality, uh, you know, mindfulness that, that we have to be in the moment with the people we're, we're interacting with so that they can better uh, so that we have a chance of, of better um, navigating all of that effectively. Um, so bringing it now back into the workplace, um, you know, beyond ourselves, working in these teams, what are the different types of traits that you often see in the workplace that have friction, where people, maybe those different personality types or different approaches um, cause um, challenges that we can overcome if we just are, are able and willing to step back, observe, and acknowledge um, what what we're dealing with. Yeah, so before I go into the specific personality traits that come up most often, I want to just highlight something and just orient everybody who's listening. So there are really three categories of interactions that cause dynamics. So there is the personality, which is what we're talking about. There's performance, and then there are preferences. So the uh, and I'll explain them all. So the preferences are really how people like to work and or communicate. And this includes everything from communication styles to working styles to learning styles. And oftentimes what will happen is if you have a learning style or a working style different from your colleague or your boss, there will be natural friction here. And it's important for people to know that because these can come up as like points where people are may maybe viewing you as somebody who isn't um, doing their job. For example, I had a client whose direct report was somebody who learned via talking. She needed to talk everything out. And my client was somebody who learned from writing. And she was getting so annoyed at her direct report who would always come to her and be like wanting to talk things through and, you know, vet ideas. And she's like, why does she keep coming to me? She's just not being like an individual thinker. She's not being strategic. And she would complain. And what the truth was is that their learning styles were a mix match. So it's important to denote that things like this can also have an impact on where there might be some friction in uh, people's ability to build the dynamics and relationships. So I, I always want to underscore the preferences piece because it does matter. On the other side is performance. And this is where somebody might not be meeting your expectations, where they really are dropping the ball. And that's a whole other hard skill conversation that doesn't have anything to do with the soft skill conversations of personality and preferences. So I just want to make sure we're all clear. And these really do intersect and they do play different roles in different relationships. So that's important to note. So back to your question around the personalities and what most gets in the way. So there are certainly archetype personality traits that pop up. And so I'll list a couple of them and many people listening will see themselves in this really quickly. And by the way, when we talk about personality traits, especially in coaching, we really do give traits like a hard name or sometimes a funny name because we want to cause a visceral reaction. We want you to understand the impact of it. And if you're always living in the sweet little intention you have, then you're never really going to get oh, crap, this is how my reputation gets impacted by this. So if anyone has a reaction, that's great. I wanted you to have one. So the, the first thing I want to say is that all traits come from our human desire to want to fit in, be accepted, not get hurt, or be rejected. All of our personality traits really do stem from those places. And we have both positive personality traits and we have negative ones. For this conversation, I'm going to talk about the negative ones, the, one that get, the ones that get in our way and can cause issues. And to be clear, I'm speaking about them very cut and dry as a negative and positive, but they're not that cut and dry. 
So for example, a personality trait like over analytical can really live in both worlds. So when you're at your job and your boss is asking you to make decisions about a big budgetary spend and you're being over analytical, that's a great trait to leverage. But when you're with your significant other and you're trying to pick out tile for your bathroom renovation, not so great. It's going to cause problems. So when I'm talking about negative personality traits, I'm talking about the traits that you know you have that mostly cause roadblocks or mostly get in the way for you. Okay, so the primary traits that pop up are first, perfectionism. Many leaders have this. People really get very concerned about failing and or looking bad and or making sure they're controlling all the outcomes. So perfectionism comes up quite often in high performers and in people who have been successful very early on in their life. And one of the double-edged swords of perfectionism is the reason why you got to be the high performer and so successful is that you really, truly made sure you kicked it out of the park each and every time. But there's a downside to it, and I'm a perfectionist, so I can speak to this downside, which is nothing is ever good enough. And you don't take really risks in the way that you should, and you can be really hard on yourself. And while most of these impacts are directed towards the individual, the person who has this trait, it also can impact your team. So I was leading a team, as you mentioned, when you were reading my uh, bio, and you know my team would give me a presentation, and I would redline it. And then they'd give it back to me with my edits, and then I would redline it again. And then we'd go through this process so many times over, and I just wanted it perfect. And what I didn't realize the impact of that was, was that my team felt like they couldn't win with me and I killed any ability for them to really demonstrate individual thought. And they, in fact, stopped trying to work harder because I always redlined it. They were not going to win. And that's an impact that I had no idea I was causing. I thought I was holding a high standard. And instead, I was producing the opposite result with my team. So that's an important one that pops up quite often in organizations. The other one is the martyr trait. And this is where the person takes on a lot of work It is happy to roll up their sleeves and jump in and support and wants to be somebody who contributes and is someone who has a lot of value. And martyrs usually are the ones that get a lot of recognition in organizations and they thrive off of that. And the downside of the martyr is really that the martyr is not telling the truth about how much they can and cannot take on. And they tend to start drowning in work. And unfortunately, what that means is they start to build resentments. And martyrs quite oftentimes become burnt out. And also, they end up in some way like blowing something up in an organization. They will either blow up a relationship, they will drop the ball on something, because they get so fed up and so resentful of all the things they've they've taken on and feel like there's no way out, that they just give up, right? They throw their hands up and it's like, forget it, I can't do anything. And that's really like the most extreme version of the downside of a martyr, but it does happen. So people need to be looking out for that. And then the last piece that I will talk about is the victim. And the victims are the people in the organization. Everybody knows them. And by the way, we've all been them at one point or another. I am not excluded. The victim is the person who always has somebody that's in their way. Somebody that's like mean to them, that doesn't say yes to them, that's an obstacle. The victim, another way of saying it, always has a bully. There's always somebody. And victims, their issue really is that they don't feel empowered and they don't know how to navigate obstacles. So they really just sit in looking at the roadblocks versus figuring out how to dance around the roadblocks. And instead of dancing around the roadblocks and stepping into their power, they end up throwing the roadblocks under the bus. So the victims are really the people who CC your boss on an email that makes you look bad so that they're not responsible for what just happened, but they make you look horrible. And or, you know, they get you in trouble or they complain about you without coming to talk to you and things like this. So these are the most common types of archetype traits that we see in organizations. And then underneath each of them, there are some almost like 
pillars of traits. So for example, under perfectionism and martyr, there's usually people pleaser. Gotta say yes to everything. Uh, you make sure you don't let anybody down. And then under victim, that's usually super critical and impatient that also play out. That was so insightful. Uh, so many great um, traits and characteristics you just described. And, and so much of that resonates with me too. I can see both, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly, you know, with myself as it plays out in some of those different types of traits. Um, and as I reflect on, you know, my interactions with others in the workplace. And so, you know, you mentioned it, it's not like any of these traits are inherently good or bad, um, but they can have, they can and will have impact. So we just have to be mindful about how we, um, how we demonstrate these traits as we go throughout our work. And we also need to be mindful about um, others and how they demonstrate theirs. You know, I like to try to take the approach of being very understanding and forgiving of others and, and assuming good intentions, um, even, even when perhaps the, something someone says or does rubs me the wrong way or I feel like it, it, it's not productive. Um, but I know that other people won't always give me that same benefit. And so we just have to be very thoughtful about the approach that we take uh, to make sure that we're having the, the, the best opportunity for success in our teams, in our collaborations. Um, something else that you talk about uh, a lot is in relation to uh, the, 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 the power of personality as it relates to also reputation and how we can improve our reputation and thereby our power and our, our position of influence. Um, could you talk a little bit about that and, and share what you mean by that? Yes. So there's a bunch of research and studies about what makes a great leader a great leader. And in much of the findings, the attributes of accountability, vulnerability, and humility pop up for leadership. So just to denote, leadership and management are two separate functions, usually of executives or people that run teams. And I'm, I'm speaking specifically about the leadership component. So the accountability, the vulnerability, and humility is really important. And so what's true is that all of us have negative parts of our personality. And in the traits that I quickly listed, your listeners, you may have heard that, okay, you know what? I am a perfectionist. Oh, yes, I definitely can, you know, be the victim sometimes. It's not bad. It means nothing bad about you. You're just human. I have a long list of really bad negative traits. I acted out on one the other day, screaming at my husband on Fifth Avenue in New York City when he offended me. Welcome to my defensive personality trait, literally on Fifth Avenue screaming at him, not flattering. And I've been doing this work for a very long time, and I should know how to nip that in the bud, but you know what? I'm human too. So no one sit here and feel bad. We're just human, and we're working on elevating ourselves. With that all said, um, what is really important is that you really do take the opportunity to go, okay, how do I lean into these attributes of accountability, vulnerability, and humility? How do I go, okay, I do know I have these sides of my personality that don't work, and then take responsibility for them. In coaching, we teach people that it's important to put yourself in a rule, or as we like to call it, a promise, which means that you are in some level of agreement with the people that work with you or for you about how they can approach you and what you're going to do about your negative personality trait when it comes out to rear its ugly head. And that's an important piece because when a leader can go, you know what, I know I'm impatient. If I'm impatient, call me out. I don't mean to shut you down in these meetings. If I'm in a rush, let me know. If I don't answer your emails, it's not because I'm too busy. I get distracted. Make sure you tap me. Come to my office and let me know. Don't let me get away with not replying to you. When a leader does that, what they are demonstrating is accountability for what doesn't work about them. And what that opens up the door for is for you to relate to them on a human-to-human -human level. So all of a sudden, there's this level of connection and vulnerability that happens in the relationship so you can really be able to uh, support each other in your goals, right, and support each other what you're taking on. And then the other piece that happens when you take on a rule like that, or as we like to call it, a promise, is that you show your humility. You show that you're not perfect that you have something to work on, and you show that you're relatable. And what is true about humility, and I always tell it to my clients, humility does not mean that you downplay where you're a rock star. That's not humility. 
Humility is owning where you suck, as we like to say in coaching, where you're not great, where you drop the ball, where you scream at your husband on Fifth Avenue on a Saturday afternoon, and owning that and just being conscious of the fact that that's where you need to develop as a human. Yeah, I love that. Uh, Wonderful insights. Uh, Krissa, it has been a real pleasure talking with you today, and we're about out of time. Um, before we close, though, I want to give you a chance to share with the listeners how they can connect with you, how they can um, learn more about what you're doing, and perhaps reach out to you if they need assistance, you know, for coaching or or to just you know share ideas and, and get some some of your thoughts. Yes, thank you. So, if you are interested in learning more about Handel Group, you can go to handelgroup.com. There is a bunch of information about all of our offerings and the various divisions that we do coaching and executive coaching uh, with companies and with individuals. You can find all that information there. In the search uh, engine on the Handel Group's website, if you type in my name, it'll pop up a page that will share with you all the things that I'm currently doing, whether it's recent podcasts, blogs, uh, free coaching community coaching seminars, uh, master classes, and other engagements. So you can find all that information there. The other thing I wanted to say to your listeners is that coaching can be absolutely an investment, and it's a great investment, um, but it is expensive at times. And so one of the things that we've created as a company is an online coaching course that really truly takes the barrier to entry away for people. And the courses are priced at really great rates. Our Inner You Career course is a bit more expensive than our Inner You Life course, but the career course comes with much more content around how to navigate your career. We also have a love course, and we're soon coming out with a diversity and inclusion course, uh, and we're creating courses for education as well as for early education. So for anyone interested in really up-leveling themselves and starting to dip their toe into this process and even learn how to deal with your personality traits, there's a whole module on it, I really recommend Inner You. If you're on the fence about coaching and don't have the cash, absolutely try it out. And the best part about it is that we offer community support once you buy the program, as well as masterclasses that go along with it to help you get yourself through the program. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that quick rundown. And I really encourage listeners to reach out to Krissa, find out more about what she's doing, connect on LinkedIn, um, check out the website, look at the services that they offer and that she can offer you. Uh, It's been a real pleasure having this discussion today. Uh, personality and, and our various traits and our intentionality, but also our behavior and the actual results of our behavior matter so much in the workplace. We need to be very thoughtful about how we interact with each other. And remember that relationships matter. They matter so much as we, um, it, as it's the people of organizations that create the innovations and the, and provide the products and services that make organizations successful. Um, so I hope all organizational leaders can remember that, that we can always um, seek to, um, to have effective, productive, um, meaningful relationships in the workplace and with the work that we are doing. And I hope everyone stays healthy and safe. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week. Check out our new weekly LinkedIn newsletter, Alchemizing Human Capital, exploring industry trends via original research and interviews with executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We look forward to having you join us.